Okay. Hi, welcome back quantum friends. Welcome back to Physics Computer Science 219A. Great to see you again. It's been too long, but the good news is we're gonna have a lot of fun today. We're getting into the uh, cool part of the course where we'll start to talk about quantum algorithms. And let me remind you where we left off last time. Um, now, of course, we would like to be able to say as a rigorous statement that quantum computers are more powerful than classical computers. We really don't know how to prove that from first principles, even though we strongly believe it's the case. Otherwise, I wouldn't be taking, or I wouldn't be teaching this course and you probably wouldn't be taking it. There are several kinds of evidence that we can marshal indicating that quantum computers can do things efficiently that are too hard for classical computers. One is we know of some algorithms that theoretically would run efficiently on a quantum computer if we can manage to build a large scale quantum computer, which I think we will. And we don't know how to solve those problems efficiently with classical computers. There are also what are sometimes called relative bias speedups or Oracle speedups. I'm gonna talk about that today uh, this is a model in which we can make rigorous statements about the separation between quantum and classical. Um, and it's an instructive model, but it does not by itself tell us that uh, there are you know, beginning to end applications and end applications of quantum computing that are exponentially faster than um, algorithms running on classical computers. And there are also uh, polynomial speedups, not exponential speedups that we can talk about, where, for example, a quantum computer solves a problem in a time which is the square root of the classical time. So that doesn't directly relate to the big question of whether BQP is strictly larger than BPP, uh, but it's nonetheless interesting, and we'll get to that. But what I want to talk about today is relativist, relativized quantum speedups in the Oracle model. So what is this Oracle model? Well, the idea is that there's some black box, and it computes a function, and we don't a priori know what that function is. We might be given some promise about the function, that it has a certain structure, but we're not told everything about it. And our task is to um, find out some property of the function to learn something more about it. And the way we keep track of the complexity in this setting is that all that we keep track of, the only thing we measure is the number of times we have to evaluate the function in order to solve the problem. And we're interested as we increase the size of the input to the function, how the number of queries, evaluations of the function, um, how many are needed to solve the problem? How does that scale with them? So all these terms mean more or less the same thing. Sometimes we call the function uh, a black box, meaning we don't necessarily know anything about its structure. Uh, sometimes we call it an oracle, you know, same idea. Um, it does something magical, which uh, we don't understand, but we can query it with a, uh, an input to the function and it will spit back the answer. And query model, again, means the same thing because we think of asking the black box questions and it gives us answers. We don't know how it does it, but um, the measure of complexity will be how many times do we have to ask the black box a question? So why is that an interesting model to consider? I mean, one way, way you might think about it is that there's some subroutine and we don't really understand how it works, but uh, we know we can call it if we're running a program. And maybe we have to pay every time uh, we wanna call that function. And uh, so we wanna keep track of the cost in terms of the number of times we have to pay the fee for making a query for evaluating the function. If what we're really interested in is the gate complexity for solving some problem, you know, the total number of gates in the circuit model that we need to run the algorithm, at least 
The number of queries will give us a lower bound on that because there will at least be one gate uh, inside the black box. And so uh, the number of gates we would need if we open the box will be at least the number of queries. And uh, sometimes we get insights from this model about complexity outside or beyond the black box model. It might be that it turns out for some particular task, it really is possible for the uh, box to be instantiated by some efficient circuit. Um, it's also important though, that the additional processing that we have to do when we get the answers uh, from the box is something we can do efficiently. In the query model, we don't worry about that, just like we don't worry about the uh, complexity of the box itself. Uh, we just wanna know, you know, from a, uh, if you like information theoretic perspective without keeping track of how hard the computation for us is, how many times we have to query the box to get enough information so we can find the property of the function f that we're looking for. So the way I'm going to distinguish quantum from classical in this setting is I'm going to consider boxes which can be queried in two ways. You can either query them with computational basis states, in which case the box behaves in a classical way. Um, I uh, essentially give it a bit string and it gives me an answer back. But the quantumness will come in because we will allow queries to the box, which are superpositions of those computational basis states. And what we're interested in is whether that ability to query in superposition gives us some additional computational power. That's what we want to study. Okay, so to get started, suppose we're talking about a function that has an n bit input. Say, suppose it's a Boolean function. So it takes n bits to one bit. Uh, we could also consider uh, functions that have many bits of output, but for now, let's just suppose it's Boolean. Now, I would like to have a model of my box, which I can think about quantum mechanically, but when we ask it a classical question, it gives a classical answer. And so we'll be thinking about this unitary transformation. We've kind of talked about this sort of thing before. Um, it's going to have two registers that it acts on. It, this unitary acts together all together on n plus one qubits. So x is n qubits, y is one qubit. And if the uh, states x and y are computational basis states, then uh, what this unitary is going to do is conditioned on the value of x, it's going to flip the value of y if f of x is equal to one and not if f of x is equal to zero, okay? So if we set y to zero, um, then uh, we query the box with x and then we can read out in this one bit answer register the value of f of x. But um, what's gonna make it quantum is we won't necessarily consider the queries to be computational basis states. So let me give you an example of a problem uh, that we can study in this setting. It was first discussed by David Deutsch back in the 1980s. And uh, now I'm gonna consider about the simplest thing we can. Uh, it's a function that takes one bit to uh, one bit, okay? So if you know the value of f of zero and f of one, then you know everything about the function, right? So you could find out everything about the function uh, if you query the box twice in the classical setting, you query it with zero and it tells you f of zero and you query it with one and it tells you f of one and that's it. But let's suppose that I don't need to know everything about the function. Let's suppose that the future of civilization uh, rests on whether I can answer a question about this function, namely, are f of zero and f of one the same value? In other words, are both inputs mapped to the same value or are they mapped to different values? So if they're mapped to the same value, I call it a constant function because for any input, uh, it gets mapped to the same value, a constant value. And balance just means that uh, the outputs zero and one 
um, occur an equal number of times when I consider all the possible inputs to the function. That's what I mean by balance. And let's suppose you know that whatever the box is doing, and we don't know what it is, it's something really complicated. So it takes um, 24 hours to get an answer back when you query the box. And we desperately need to know whether the function is constant or balanced. We don't really care what the value of f of zero and f of one are. All we want to know is whether those two values are the same. We only want to answer the constant or balanced question. Now, in the classical query setting, tough luck, uh, we're going to have to query the box twice because each time we query it, we get the value of the function for one particular input. And that's not going to tell us whether the function is balanced or constant. Um, we can't afford to wait 48 hours. The world is going to explode if we don't get the answer in the next 24 hours. So we just got to do it with one query. So what happens if we can query in superposition? Does that make things better? It does. Now, with a quantum query with a superposition of computational basis states, one query will be enough to answer the question whether the function is constant or balanced and civilization can be saved. So how does this work? Um, well, there, there are kind of two tricks that come in. The first I'm gonna call the phase kickback trick. We'll see a more general version of it later. And the idea here is that answer register, the second register, we can, if we choose it, uh, input state to be an appropriate superposition, we can make it into a phase oracle. So the information about uh, whether f of x is equal to zero or f of x equals one comes back as the relative phase of different query states. So how does that go? Well, um, let's consider the poly operator x. You remember what that is. It flips the bit. It takes the state zero to the state one, the state one to the state zero. Let me consider uh, x raised to the power a, where a is a bit. So that e either that means the identity if x is equal to zero, and it means x if, sorry, it means the identity if a is equal to zero, and it means x if a is equal to one. So you won't disagree with this statement that x to the a acting on a basis state, either zero or one, I can write as y x or a. If a is equal to zero, is the identity, it doesn't do anything. If a is equal to one, it's gonna flip the value, okay? So let's see what happens. I think you know this. If I consider the uh, superposition, either the uniform superposition or the superposition with a relative phase of the basis state zero and one, well, they are in fact the eigenstates of um, the poly operator X. The uniform superposition with a plus sign when x acts um, is an eigenstate with eigenvalue one because zero and one uh, change places and that doesn't change the uniform superposition. But when zero and one change places, uh, the minus superposition flips phase, right? So the minus state zero minus one properly normalized is the eigenstate of x with eigenvalue minus one. Zero plus one is the eigenstate with eigenvalue um, plus one. So I can write that this way, uh, x to the a acting on the basis states plus or minus, give me minus one to the a uh, basis states plus or minus, okay? Because of course, if a is equal to zero, this is just the identity and uh, neither plus or minus are affected. Uh, but if a is equal to one, then um, the uh, states plus and minus have opposite eigenvalues. Okay, so I'm going to make use of this nice property of the minus state that um, we get a phase when x acts, because what our remember what our um, what our oracle is going to do? It's going to XOR whatever is in the uh, second register with the value of f of x, where f is the secret function that the black box evaluates. So if I query with x, the computational basis state, and minus in the second register, well, um, that's that xor uh, with f of x 
that's the same thing as x raised to the power f of x. And that's going to be the same thing as minus one to the f of x, because this is the eigenstate of x with eigenvalue minus one. So the minus superposition isn't affected by the query, minus goes to minus, but what happens is the phase of the state is affected. Um, we either get a minus one if f of x is equal to one, or we get no phase, just one, when f of x is equal to zero. And that's, now I'm done with the second register. We're not gonna need to talk about it anymore. Um, it's not really affected by the query. And so we might as well just say that what our uh, box does is when we query it with computational basis state X, it modifies the phase of that computational basis state by minus one to the F of X, either flips the phase if F of X is equal to one or it um, leaves the phase alone um, if F of X is uh, equal to zero. Okay, now of course, if I give it a classical query in the X register, who cares? Changing the phase uh, isn't going to uh, change anything. It's just an overall phase. But the way I can take advantage of that phase kickback is by querying with a superposition of two values of X. So that's what we do. We consider now, remember, now I'm just talking, I'm forgetting about the answer register now, which is set to minus one. And what that managed to do was give us this phase kickback. And now I'm going to query with the superposition of zero and one in the X register, okay? And the zero is gonna pick up a phase minus one to the F of zero. The one is going to pick up a phase minus one to the F of one, okay? So up to an overall phase, this is going to be the state zero plus one with appropriate normalization if the function is constant, if f of zero is equal to f of one. If the function is balanced, then the two phases are different. So up to an overall phase, perhaps of minus one, uh, this will be the state minus if the function is balanced. So it's plus if the function is constant, minus if the function is balanced. So now after just that one query, I can measure in the basis the X eigenstate basis, the plus minus basis. If I get plus, I know it's a constant function. And if I get minus, I know it's a balanced function. Now, the way we defined our computational model, you remember, as we said, I think that um, we're supposed to make our measurements in the computational basis, but that's okay. Um, before I measure in the computational basis, the zero one basis, I can apply the Hadamard that's the uh, guy that maps the X basis to the Z basis. So it'll take plus to zero minus to one. So measuring in the plus minus basis, that's the same thing as first applying the Hadamard and then measuring in the computational basis. So that's what I do. And we've seen that there's a difference between the quantum and classical queries. With classical queries, we've got to have two to determine if the function is constant or balanced. With quantum qu queries, um, just one. So civilization has been saved by use of quantum queries. So let's try to make it a little more interesting by having a variable input size. So now I'm going to consider, it's called the deutsch joseph problem, um, which was discussed in the late 1980s by those two guys, uh, Richard Josa and David Deutsch. Now we're going to have a function which maps n bits to one bit. It's not an arbitrary function this time. There's going to be a promise about it. We're gonna to be told that either one of two possibilities is going to hold. Either F is a constant function or it's a balanced function. What does balance mean here? Well, now there are two to the n possible input values of X. So what I mean by balance is that for half of those input values of X, F of X is equal to zero. And for the other half, F of X is equal to one zero and one occur for the same number of possible inputs. So altogether, two to the n minus one values of x will be mapped to zero by the function. And altogether, two to the n minus one values of x will be mapped to one by the function. Okay, so what do you think we're going to do? I bet you can guess. We're gonna query in superposition. We're gonna use phase kickback like we did before. Okay, so we're going to um, 
I'm talking about, I'm still talking about a Boolean function. It's taking n bits to one bit. So we, we fix that uh, answer register, that one qubit in the state minus. Now we get a phase kickback. Um, we are going to prepare the uniform superposition of all possible values of x. That's actually quite easy to do. Um, we just apply a Hadamard to each one of n qubits um, where the qubits are initialized at zero. And that's going to give me for each qubit, the uniform superposition of zero and one. And altogether, that means every bit string occurs with the same amplitude, one over the square root of two to the n. And now we query the box. And now the phases get modified in this superposition of all these values of x. We get a superposition of all of two to the n values of x. I'm gonna call it x equals zero to two to the n minus one since I'm thinking of those bit strings as binary representations of integers, which are expressed in terms of n bits. So that can be any integer, uh, non-negative integer from zero to two to the n minus one. And uh, that uh, computational basis state X in this uh, uniform or rather this coherent superposition is going to pick up the phase minus one to the F of X. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to measure all the qubits in that plus minus basis, okay? Um, another way of saying it is I apply that Hadamard to each one of the n qubits. I'm calling it a bitwise Hadamard or Hadamard H tensor n times, single qubit gate applied to each one of uh, the n qubits. Now, if the function is constant, then uh, that means that I get the same phase every time. It's just minus one to that constant. And so this is again, just the superposition of all possible bit strings, which is the same thing as the superposition of zero and one for each one of the n qubits. So uh, the plus state tensored n times. And um, then when I do the Hadamard on each one of the qubits, that's going to map be mapped for each qubit to zero. So in the case where the function is constant up to a phase of plus or minus one, depending on whether the constant value of F is zero or one, um, we're just going to get the uh, state of all zeros. Okay, that's in the function is constant, but what happens if the function is balanced? Um, okay, yeah, this is, I just told you, this is what happens when the function is constant. What if it's balanced? So what I wanna know is what is the amplitude for getting the outcome of all zeros in the case where the function is balanced. So um, that is, um, I'm going to do the query and then I'm going to apply that bitwise Hadamard and then I'm going to measure in the computational basis state. As we've noted, that's the same thing as saying I'm looking for the inner product of the state after the query with the product of pluses for all the qubits because the Hadamard acting on zero gives a plus. And that plus is just the superposition of um, zero and one. So the product of all the pluses, again, that's just the same thing as one over the square root of two to the n, sum, uniform sum without any relative phases of all the possible bit strings, or if you like all integers, y equals zero to two to the n minus one. I'm interested in the inner product of that with the state I have after the query and the phase kickback has occurred. So it's uh, this inner product. And uh, of course, these sums here are going to collapse. I'm only going to get terms with x equals y. I had two factors of one over the square root of two to the n. So I got a one over two to the n. And then I have a sum of all the phases minus one to the f of x. And that's gonna be true in general, uh, no matter what f of x is. But if it's a balanced function, that's gonna be zero because half of these phases are gonna be plus one and half of them are gonna be minus one, right? Half the values of x, f of x is equal to zero and the phase is plus one for half the values of x, f of x is equal to one then the phase is minus one. So all the phases cancel, okay? So the 
after I've done that bitwise Hadamard, the overlap with the all zero state um, in the case where the function is balanced is zero. So I query, I use the face kickback trick, I Hadamard and I measure. If the function is constant with probability one, all the outcomes are zero for measurements on all n qubits. And if the function is uh, balanced, then I'm never going to get the outcome where all the measurements are zero. I'm going to get some other bit string, never all zeros, always something else. So with just one query, okay, we either get all zeros and conclude the function is balanced, sorry, constant. It's constant when we get all zeros or we get something else and then we know the function is balanced. All right, so just one query answered the question, pretty cool. And it doesn't depend on n at all, the number of queries we need because it's always one, no matter um, how large the input size for the function. Now, if we had only deterministic classical queries, um, in the worst case, uh, you know, we would choose one value of x after another and uh, query the box. If we were really uh, made really bad choices, the worst case uh, would be even if the function is balanced, I just happen uh, two to the n minus one times in a row to query with the value of x that gets mapped to the same value every time, either zero or one. So I still don't know in that worst case after two to the n minus one uh, queries, after I've input half of the possible values of x, I still don't know for sure whether it's constant or balanced. And I have to finally get to two to the n minus one plus one. And then um, because it's a balanced function, if it is balanced, um, I can't get the same value. Again, I have to get the other value and then I know it's balanced. Um, and if I get uh, the same value once again, then I know it has to be constant. So, that's, uh, if you like, a um, exponential separation, since in the worst case, uh, I need an exponential number of queries uh, if they're classical queries, whereas in the uh, case of quantum queries, just one query was enough, but that's, that's kind of fake. It, it's better to think of it as a randomized algorithm where I choose random values of x to query with, and then I'd really have to be exceedingly unlucky to uh, choose queries uh, two to the n minus one times in a row that always get mapped to the same output. So what's uh, really gonna happen is I can query some not huge number of times. And if I get the same value every time, then I can be very confident that it, the function is really constant and that didn't just happen by accident. And if I ever get, um, a response when I query that's different from the previous responses, then of course I know the function isn't constant and I'm done. I can declare that the uh, function is balanced because I've been promised it's either constant or balanced. So, um, you know, if you, if you, if the function really is, I think that's what it says here is if the function really is balanced and I query k times, um, and then I'm going to declare either constant or balanced based on whether I got the same answer every time or not. Uh, the unlucky case in which I fail is when just by accident, I got the same answer k times in a row, even though the function is balanced. But every time I do a query, if it's a random query, I have probability one half of getting zero, one half of getting one. For me to get the same value in k queries, uh, k times in a row, the probability of that is just the probability of getting either all heads or all tails when you flip an unbiased coin k times, that's a probability of one over two to the k minus one. So I don't have to choose k to be very large to have a small probability of getting the wrong answer in this randomized algorithm. So in other words, I can solve the problem efficiently either in the randomized classical setting or the quantum setting. In the quantum setting, I'm right every time. In the classical setting, I can easily make the probability of failure 
uh, quite small with a number of queries, which um, is uh, not very large and doesn't actually depend on the value of n. It just depends on the error that I'm willing to accept. All right, so that was kind of instructive, but uh, not terribly exciting. Now let's try to make it more interesting and see if we can find an exponential separation in query complexity between quantum queries and randomized classical queries for some black box problem. And I'm gonna tell you such a problem. It's called Simon's problem after Daniel Simon. And he uh, proposed it and analyzed it back in 1994. Now I'm gonna consider a function which uh, takes n bits to n bits instead of a Boolean function. And I'm gonna give you a promise. Um, well, first I'm gonna tell you uh, one version of the problem, then I'm gonna massage it a little to make it into a decision problem in case you think that's important. Um, so let's say I'm promised that this function is actually two to one. So every output has, um, that occurs has two pre-images, but furthermore, it has a special structure, which is that X and Y are mapped to the same output if and only if the bitwise XOR of X and Y is either zero, which of course means X equals Y, or equal to some bit string A. So what I mean by that notation, these are actually N bit strings, X, Y, and A. I say that X, um, X or Y is equal to A. I mean, that's true bit by bit, that X zero, X or Y zero, X or is just addition mod two. So maybe I should just say plus to save myself uh, from saying X or all the time. Um, and it means X one plus O Y one is equal to A one, X two plus Y two is equal to A two and so on. So in other words, A is equal to one if the bits X I and uh, Y I are distinct and equal to zero if they're the same. And our problem is to find A, and we wanna do that with as few queries to the function as we can, okay? So how hard is it classically? Well, just if you want uh, to think about decision problems, I'll note that we can turn this into one. Uh, we could say that actually the promise is that either this is a one-to-one -one function, so every output has just a single preimage, or it's two-to-one with the structure that I described here, which I'll say is, uh, the function has some period A, just meaning that I can add A to uh, the input and um, get, uh, get the same output, okay? Um, well, the problem formulated as a decision problem is in what I'll call NP super O. That means O is an oracle. It's, it's this box that we can query, this particular function uh, concerning which uh, we are given the promise. And uh, we'd like to solve the problem. Well, what if somebody gives you a witness? Can you check the solution to the problem? Well, that's pretty easy because I could be so kind as to give you the value of A. And then even in the case of classical queries, um, it would be easy for you to check that A and zero both get mapped to the same value. And then you will know that A is indeed the period of the function with just two queries, two classical queries are enough to check once you have the witness. Um, but I'm going to argue that Simon's problem is not in BPP super O, that with access to this Oracle, uh, you can't distinguish the two to one case with this structure and the one to one case, except with exponentially small probability, or I should say one half plus something exponentially small, because you could always make a random guess and uh, find the answer with a success probability of one half, um, that um, you can't, um, except with an exponentially small probability, um, get the answer with a polynomial number of queries. That's what I mean when I say it's not in BPP super O. Um, so, so why is it so hard with random queries? Well, what can we do? We're just gonna, oh, the best we can do is just randomly query 
some number of times. Um, so suppose we query all together k times and we choose a random value of x each time. So if f is actually two to one, uh, we'll solve the problem even if, only if we are so lucky that two of the values of x that we queried with happen to get mapped to the same value of f of x. They happen to be pre-images of the same output value for f. And um, well, that's not very likely because if I just consider one pair of inputs in particular, um, x and y, uh, x gets mapped to f of x, what's the, uh, what's the probability that um, y different from x will get mapped to that same value. Well, there's only one possibility. It would have to be x plus a. I'd have to choose, be so lucky as to choose y is equal to x plus a. I don't know anything a priori about what a is. So um, I, of course, I don't, I didn't mean uh, two to the n minus one. I think I went one, I meant one over two to the n minus one. Uh, the probability of getting lucky for a, a pair of queries. If I query all together k times, well, you can think of that as I now have a sample of k choose two candidate pairs of input values of x. For each one of those pairs, um, I have this small probability of getting lucky. So the probability that we're successful in k randomized queries isn't going to be larger than the number of pairs of k queries uh, times the probability of success for each pair, which is just one over two to the n minus one. So that's less than k squared over two to the n. So I can actually choose k to be exponentially large, like say two to the one half n times one minus epsilon. And this probability of success would still be less than two to the minus epsilon n in that case. So even though uh, for some fixed epsilon, I'm considering an exponentially large number of queries. Um, the probability of success is going to be exponentially small in n. And that's why I say uh, it's not in BPP super O. We don't have a way of solving the problem with a reasonable success probability with a reasonable number of queries. Uh, but I'm going to argue that uh, Simon's problem is in BQP super O, that is, if we're allowing quantum queries, we can solve the problem efficiently. That is with a number of queries, which is in fact just linear in N, we can solve the problem with high success probability. And so on that basis, I can make the claim that relative to this Oracle O, that's what I mean by a relativized separation, relative to this Oracle, when that Oracle is available to be queried, there's a separation between uh, being able to solve the problem with classical queries and quantum queries. I need an exponential number of randomized classical queries, but I can do it with a polynomial number, in fact, a linear number and then of quantum queries. So within this black box model, we can make the statement that quantum computing interpreted as the ability to query in superposition is more powerful than randomized classical computing. All right. So now I have to tell you what that quantum algorithm is and how that works. Okay. So, you know, you kind of know the routine by now, I guess. I want to query with a uniform superposition of all the computational basis states like I did in the Deutsch-Joseph problem. I'm not going to use phase kickback this time. So, um, I guess if you want to think of it as a circuit diagram, it looks like this. We have the register that we query in. We have a register where the answer appears. Uh, they're both n-bit registers. So in order to query with a uniform superposition of all possible inputs, <coughs> I can imagine starting with all zeros and doing the uh, bitwise Hadamard. And then now, um, the box is going to apply a unitary, which is going to add the n-bit string f of x to an n-bit an n n answer register this time. And this is just a symbol for measurement. Um, I'm going to want to measure not in the computational basis after the query, 
but in the complementary basis, if you like the Hadamard basis, or equivalently, I'm going to do a um, bitwise Hadamard on all the n bits and then measure in the computational basis. Okay, so let's see what happens. So we prepare this uniform superposition of all queries, uniform superposition of all values of x. We set the answer register to zero and then we do the query. And so uh, for each input value of x, f of x is going to be written on uh, the second register. So now we get an entangled state, a massively entangled state of uh, the two registers. And sum over all two to the n values of x, x tensored f of x in the output register. Okay. And then uh, what I'm going to do is, if you like, just trace out that answer register. I don't need it anymore. I can throw it away. And then we're going to uh, do this uh, measurement in the Hadamard basis in the uh, query register. Now, I said you can trace out or measure, you know, as we've discussed before, you could think of um, tracing out as being like measuring but throwing away the outcome. We can imagine, if you like, that we actually measure the value of the answer register. We get some particular f of x zero. What we're really going to have in the input register is a mixture of um, all the different states that can be obtained for different orthogonal basis states of the output register. So we're going to have a mixture of uh, states, one corresponding to each possible value of f of, f of x. But let's look at one particular of those states because the thing is, um, our algorithm isn't going to really care about the value of x sub zero. It's going to work the same way, no matter what the value of x sub zero is. Even though we know what it is, we're not going to use that information. So whether we measure or not doesn't matter. So we don't need to know what it is, so we don't really need to measure. And we will still have a decoherence between you know, the different values of that uh, answer register um, f of x. And so we can imagine that we're looking at any one of the um, pure states in a uh, ensemble representing the uh, mixed state that we have in the answer register. Well, why don't I just say we measured, okay? We measured and we got a particular value f of x zero. So what does that mean? Well, let's suppose the function is two to one, or if you like, let's consider the version of the problem where the task is not to determine whether it's two to one or one to one, but to find a, we know it's two to one, we'd like to find a. Of course, if it's two to one and we can find a, then once we find a, we can easily check that a is correct because now it's like the what I said before, we have the witness and we can just query twice to check that it's, it's really right, that f of zero is equal to f of a. Um, but what we're going to get now is because there are two values, it's a two to one function, which are mapped to each one of the outputs that occurs. Um, Corresponding to f of x zero in the answer register are the two pre-images of f of x zero, which are x zero and x zero plus a. And because we started out with a uniform superposition of all the inputs, we're going to get this uniform superposition of the two pre-images, x zero and x zero plus a. Um, I guess I wrote plus a instead of um, xor or o plus, but you can just think of that as bitwise um, arithmetic mod two. I should change that and make it into an O plus. Whoops. Oh, where are we here? Okay. No, I've already done that. Um, oh, I did that too. Okay. All right. Um, now, this is what we have in the answer register. We, oh, sorry, in the input register, in the query register, we threw the answer away. We're not going to need it. Um, so now what? Well, we could measure in the computational basis, but that really wouldn't do us any good at all because the, the outcome would just be one of these two computational basis states, each occurring with a probability one half, either x0 or x0 plus a. But um, what good is that, uh, is that gonna do? Um, it's not gonna tell me anything about a. I didn't know anything about a to begin with. Um, x0 and x0 plus a by itself, that's not enough to tell me a. If I knew them both, of course, then I, then I would know a. But 
uh, measuring the computational basis isn't going to tell me both. It'll tell me one or the other. So I don't want to do that. Instead, I'm going to do what I said here. I'm going to measure in the, the complementary basis. I'm going to do the bitwise Hadamard and then measure. So we want to see what happens in that case. Well, uh, let me go back. I'm going to just introduce a little more notation, which is kind of handy. So what does a Hadamard do? Acting on a single uh, qubit. Well, let X be one of the computational basis states. It's either zero or one. Remember, it takes zero to zero plus one, and it takes one to zero minus one. So let me write that in this uh, fancy way. X, either zero or one, gets mapped to one over square root of two, zero plus minus one to the X one. So in other words, if X is equal to one, I get a relative minus sign here, and if X is equal to zero, I don't. And uh, here's another fancy way to write it. Um, I have the one over square root of two, and now I'm summing over the um, computational basis state, which can be either zero or one. And I can write the phase as minus one to the x, y. I'm going to get a phase only in the case in which both x and y are one, okay? So now let's do the same thing when we do the bitwise Hadamard acting on some bit string. So let's consider this n bit string, one of the computational basis states. Each one of the qubits is either a zero or a one as indicated by the uh, xi's. And now I do all the Hadamards and let's use uh, this little formula to see what happens then. Well, for each one of the Hadamards, I've got some, uh, it's acting on some um, basis state xi and that's going to be mapped to one over square root of two times the sum over the two, this should be y sub i. Uh, two possible values of y sub i, and the phase is minus one to the x i y i. There's a non-trivial phase only when both x i and y i are one, and it's a tensor product of, of n uh, such uh, states. And um, if we just expand that out, I've got um, all these possible bit strings occurring here. Um, and the overall phase associated with the output state um, yn minus one, yn minus two, blah, 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 y1, y0 is going to be minus one to a power and that power uh, just um, sums up all these phases. I can, or takes, gives me the product of all these phases. So it's minus one to the um, x0, y0, times minus one to the x1, y1, plus my, times minus one to the x2, y2, and so on. And I'm just writing that as minus one to the x dot y. And by x dot y, I mean this bitwise inner product of n bit strings, uh, the sum of x i, y i, i going from zero to n minus one. And I might as well say mod two because all I care about is whether that's an even or an odd um, integer the number of times that the strings X and Y collide, in other words, whether that's even or odd parity is the only thing that matters because I'm, it's minus one raised to this power. And if that's an even number, that's one. And if it's an odd number, it's minus one, okay? Okay, so now this just repeats what I just told you. Um, acting on some computational basis state for n qubits, the bitwise Hadamard is going to give me this, okay? And uh, now I want to consider what happens when the state that I'm acting on is this coherent superposition, this uniform superposition of two computational basis states, the two pre-images of a particular output value for f of x, namely x0 plus x0, um, xra. Okay, so now I've got this one over uh, two to the n over two here, and I've got this extra one over square root of two here. So I'm combining those together to give me, oh, yeah, that's right. To give me a prefactor of one over two to the n plus one over two. So I'm still summing y over all of the two to the n possible values. But now I tab the sum of two different phases. From x0, I get minus one to the x0 dot y. And from x0, x or a, I get minus one to the x0, x or a dot y. 
And now, you know, the magic of interference can appear. Some answers are going to happen with some non-zero probability, and some are going to happen with zero probability because those two phases cancel. If one's a plus one and the other one is a minus one, uh, that value of y is not going to appear with a non-zero coefficient in the superposition. Well, let's factor out minus one to the x0 dot y, and then um, what remains is the sum of one and minus one to the a dot y, okay? And that's either going to be zero if, um, if a dot y is uh, mod two is equal to plus one, or it's gonna be two if a dot y is equal to zero mod two. If a dot y is even, in other words, um, it's gonna be two if a dot y is odd, we're gonna get zero. So what survives, so since it's two, that's gonna get rid of uh, factor two here. So now the denominator is two to the n minus one over two. And then occurring in the superposition are all the values of y such that a dot y is equal to zero. So uh, if you like the language we could use in the sense of a binary linear algebra is that what occurs are all the values of y which are orthogonal to a, such that that bitwise inner product of a with y is equal to zero. And the values for which uh, it's equal to one, um, they occur, don't, they don't occur. The coefficient is zero in that case. Now there's also a phase that depends on y that's where the x zero comes in, but I don't really care about this phase because what I'm gonna do now is measure in the computational basis. And that phase associated with each value of y isn't going to affect the probability distribution uh, for those measurement outcomes. In fact, what is that probability distribution? With probability zero, um, we get the values of y which are not orthogonal to a, the one such that y dot a is uh, equal to one, and with uniform probability, all occurring with the same amplitude squared, namely one over two to the n minus one, are all the values of y that are orthogonal to a, such that a dot y is equal to zero. So that's what we learn by running one query. We randomly sample from all the values of y that are orthogonal to a. That's giving us a, some information about A. That's giving us some information. Not, not enough information to know A, not yet. So we run that same routine multiple times. Every time we're sampling uniformly from all the values of Y that are orthogonal to A. After we've done it enough times with high probability, we will have n minus one values of y, which are all linearly independent in the sense of you know, binary linear algebra, all linearly independent values, um, which are all orthogonal to a. So you can think of this as you know, we're trying to find a vector in the sense of binary linear algebra, um, which, uh, which is in an n-dimensional vector space. And once we know n minus one linearly independent vectors that it's orthogonal to, then that vector is, un is uh, uniquely determined. And in fact, it's an easy linear algebra problem. I'm not gonna go through the details of this since um, it's straightforward. And I think uh, you all know how to figure it out that uh, once you have those n minus uh, one values of y, which are all linearly independent and all orthogonal to a, uh, there's an easy um, matrix inversion problem for finding A and you're done, you found A, okay? And if, if in the decision problem, you know, if you find A in the case where the function really is two to one, then of course you can check uh, that A really is the period of the function to uh, verify that um, the function really is two to one. Uh, furthermore, as I guess I said already, but I'll repeat, is that it, you don't need a large number of trials to have a high probability of finding these n minus one uh, linearly independent values of y that we need to uniquely identify a. Uh, so in fact, um, 
each time you run another query and do the measurement, in other words, each time that you randomly sample from the strings that are orthogonal to A, if you haven't already found a set of n minus one linearly independent vectors, then you're going to have a probability of at least one half of um, finding one which is linearly independent of what you've already found. Okay, because every time uh, you find one, um, well, just think about it. Uh, once you once you uh, once you have n minus two uh, values of y, which are all linearly independent, uh, in this n minus one dimensional space, which is orthogonal to A, then uh, of the strings that remain, um, half are linearly independent, and uh, and half are linearly dependent. And when you have when you so far you've only found um, you know, n minus three of the values of y that are linearly independent, then you have an even better chance of finding one that's linear independent of what you already have found uh, the next time you run the algorithm. So you have a probability at least one half every time of um, finding a vector orthogonal to a, which is linearly independent of the ones that you've already found. And so really, um, if you run the procedure, m times, you're sampling from the strings, which are orthogonal to a altogether m times, um, you will have not yet uh, solved the problem if somehow by accident uh, you haven't yet succeeded in finding n minus one linearly independent values that are orthogonal to a. But the likelihood of that happening is um, actually not no worse than the probability that when you toss a coin uh, m times that you have um, that you know you failed to get heads. Um, um, let's see, <laughs> smaller. Uh, you're trying you're trying to get heads. With heads corresponds to to the winning possibility that you find something linearly independent of uh, what you already have. You have probability at least one half. Of doing that, if it were exactly one half, that would like be like the probability that an unbiased coin comes up heads, and you want to be sure that you get heads n minus one times, then you're done. Um, but uh, to have a high probability of getting heads at least n minus one times, uh, it's enough to toss the coin a number of times, which is some constant times n, and then the probability that you haven't managed to get heads n minus one times is going to be off on the tail of a Gaussian distribution and the probability of failure will be very small. So the number of queries that we need to solve the problem to identify A uh, is linear in end. In the quantum case, in the case where we can do these quantum queries, which enables us to prepare this uniform superposition of the two different inputs that go to the same output, and then uh, because we can also measure, we don't want to measure in the computational basis, if we measure in the complementary basis, the Hadamard basis, then we get information about A and we don't have to do it many times. So that's the story. So you have seen that we can solve Simon's problem with order n queries, some constant times n number of queries, um, if we're allowed to do quantum queries, okay? But if we're limited to randomized classical queries, or if we can only query with the uh, computational basis states with bit strings, then we'll need an exponential number of queries to um, identify A with a better than uh, exponential uh, success probability. And so that's the basis of my statement that we have a strict inclusion of BPP relative to Simon's oracle um, in BQP relative to the oracle. Or if you like, there is an oracle such that BPP and BQP are distinct, BQP being larger, um, relative to that oracle. So that's nice. It's a, a remarkable result. It's very simple to see how it works. It works through the magic of interference that the values of y that we don't want 
uh, don't occur because of interfering amplitudes, the values of y that we do want that are useful to us occur. And um, we do it enough times and, and we have all the information we need. Now, remarkable as it is, does it have any practical applications? Well, actually not that I know of. To find a real application, uh, we would like to have some instantiation of Simon's Oracle, some function that we could really um, evaluate so that we could operate the black box ourselves and such that the problem is still hard classically even when the structure of that function is known, okay? And well, we don't know, uh, at least I don't know an example like that. Of course, ideally we would also want it to be some problem that uh, we care about the answer for some practical reason. And because Simon's algorithm has no obvious real world applications, his original paper was rejected when he submitted it to a conference, even though it's a brilliant paper. But the problem and its solution turned out to be very inspiring and in fact led to another black box problem for which we can prove analogously to what we did today, a separation between quantum and classical query complexity. And that one does turn out to have practical applications. So that's what I wanna tell you about in the next lecture. Uh, so until then, uh, good to see you again. Until next time, take care of yourself, uh, stay healthy and uh, see you again soon.